Okay. So this is now this is my official uh, show here. Uh, that's the part which uh, which I was planning for as well. Uh, Jerome has uh, introduced or spoken multiple times about this uh, this uh, this survey that we did as a complement uh, to the uh, CFO survey. Uh, but before I go into the details and into the uh, into the general theme of the survey, uh, I'm actually totally remiss in not mentioning that we actually do have two members, uh, two board members of the International Accounting Standards Board uh, with us here. So uh, it's uh, very clear that uh, the battle is is capturing the attention uh, of the IASB uh, and uh, and that uh, they're very attentively uh, listening to uh, to the battle noise, if, as it were. So it's Steve Cooper uh, who will hear later on, and also Philippe Donjou, uh, who is uh, who is in the audience. But uh, let me go now into the uh, results of the survey. Uh, the general theme uh, could be summarized as one of cognitive dissonance. Uh, and here you've got the, the definition of cognitive dissonance uh, from Wikipedia. Uh, it is the actual stress, the mental stress and discomfort uh, that an individual holds uh, if uh, he or she holds two or more uh, contradictory beliefs, ideas or values at the same time. Uh, so you could imagine that uh, that if we had uh, the if the analyst community were, were an individual uh, that fictitious uh, that fictitious community part then uh, that uh, that individual would be under very severe uh, cognitive dissonance uh, if uh, if our uh, if the survey results uh, were held by that specific individual why is that let me explain um, Actually, and, and I'm just really summarizing the brief, the main results here. Uh, we've been uh, sending out this, uh, the survey questions to the members of, uh, of both uh, the Swiss Financial Analysts Association and the CFA Society Switzerland, uh, about 5,000 individuals. Uh, and, so they, and they have a whole range of different profiles. Uh, you'll see that list uh, later on again, so let me quickly uh, explain what it is. Uh, first off uh, is uh, all responses, so all uh, respondents uh, are under that category. Then the second category, investors, uh, is the, those people who responded that they are making investment decisions based on fundamental financial reporting. Uh, very catch-all uh, kind of category. Then credit and equity, uh, that's uh, two categories where people were asked to identify themselves or to associate themselves with one uh, with one or the other more specific uh, type of interest in uh, how they are looking at financial reporting. So the credit uh, analyst typically would be uh, looking at it from the bond buyer perspective, whereas the equity uh, analyst obviously uh, buys uh, the equity, the stock uh, in the firm. And that's a very uh, important uh, distinction and uh, uh, as well because obviously there's uh, uh, more analysis, uh, technical, an technical analysis going into the uh, credit uh, analysis type of uh, approach. Similarly, uh, the, the uh, very well-known buy side, sell side uh, this that's where we asked uh, people to associate themselves with either one of uh, those sites uh, in terms of categories. So from the, uh, from the results, you can see that uh, basically the, uh, the first uh, question here is uh, whether they were welcoming the trend uh, to switch. And uh, almost uh, the majority of respondents were actually welcoming uh, that trend to switch. Uh, and uh, that's, that's, that's basically the, the part where, where the dissonance comes in. If you asked uh, analysts, investors, the question, is that something that you, you feel comfortable with? Is that something you're okay with, uh, this general trend? Then uh, they will tell you, yeah, it's okay. Uh, we can live with that. Not an issue, really, very much. So if it's just the political kind of uh, attitude that you're asking, if it's, can I ask the, the bad word of economic patriotism kind of uh, approach, the, the Swissness uh, part of it, uh, is that something that you're supporting, uh, then yes, people are obviously in favor of it, they're supporting it. That's not a problem. 
uh, but uh, if you're looking at it uh, more specifically, for instance, uh, from uh, the credit analyst uh, perspective, then uh, you, you get a totally different picture, as well as if you look at it from the buy side perspective. Uh, and that will be a recurring theme. Uh, do you think that the trend uh, to switch will continue? Uh, we've heard that as well in the uh, in the uh, in the CFO survey. Uh, again, uh, uh, there's a huge majority, and there's actually an overall majority among all respondents uh, that the trend uh, will be continuing. Uh, but uh, again, uh, the uh, the the no opinion uh, part uh, on the on the buy side uh, and the credit uh, side is uh, is the stronger. Uh, Part. But again, that's still this political uh, kind of uh, answer to the question that, uh, that uh, we've been asking. Uh, we also asked whether uh, the switchers, uh, the, the issuers who were making the switch so far, uh, have actually given appropriate justification for, uh, for their deed. Uh, and, uh, and again, as you can see, the overall answer was almost a majority of yes that they did. Um, investors certainly, uh, equity sells uh, definitely the sell side. But again, our uh, credit analyst and uh, our buy side analyst, uh, they were uh, a lot more skeptical uh, about that. Not outright uh, negative, uh, certainly not, uh, but not sure. So there, there's the, that creep in uh, already coming when it gets more specific. Now, what's the actual uh, context? What's the, the important, the decisive factors? We've obviously touched uh, or asked about that as well. Uh, we've had the question, uh, that, that was, that's the summary of a number of questions, actually. Uh, in the first part, in the first column, we asked for the importance uh, of those four factors, the comparability of financial reports across countries, uh, then the requirement for fair value uh, in, the, in the report, uh, for assets and uh, etc. Uh, then the comprehensiveness uh, or the requ requirement for comprehensive disclosures as well and the cost uh, to the company. And uh, on a scale from one to five, uh, obviously you get the, the importance there as well and clearly comparability and co uh, the requirement for comprehensive disclosures uh, are the two uh, categories that stand out in terms of weight, uh, of importance, uh, the uh, cost to the company is the least uh, important uh, from the investor perspective and I think that's quite reasonable as well because obviously ultimately it's the investor uh, who pays the bill uh, for the more uh, detailed information as well. It's the, uh, it's the, it's the uh, marginally reduced profitability due to uh, higher costs which, uh, which the investor uh, ultimately pays. Um, but uh, if you're looking at it from the satisfaction, if you're looking at the, the, the two sets of standards that we're, that we're following, uh, then uh, you actually get to see that uh, these, uh, the, the IFRS satisfaction is, uh, is uh, higher or uh, at least similar uh, with regards to uh, the, the main criteria, but definitely at the cost to the company, it's significantly uh, uh, lower the satisfaction from the uh, from the uh, analyst investor community. Uh, and uh, obviously the NM, the not meaningful, uh, was basically referring to the fact uh, that, uh, that uh, there are no uh, comparable uh, companies that produce Swiss gap, uh, Swiss gap reports uh, in, uh, in other uh, countries, so there's no comparability issue there. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, was there change of relevant information after the switch? We've already heard a lot about that from in, uh, in Oliver's uh, presentation as well. Um, here uh, we're getting into the, into the meaty part, into those pieces uh, where we're actually seeing uh, the change over from that general political support in favor uh, of, uh, of the switch to, uh, to Swiss Gap towards a more skeptical uh, uh, approach, a more skeptical reaction as well. Uh, and most pronouncedly, uh, obviously, uh, in the credit uh, part where people felt uh, 
that there was uh, a, a significant reduction in information that they were getting, uh, as well as on the buy side, on the people that uh, identified uh, themselves with the buy side. So there, there is certainly a perception uh, uh, on the uh, on on parts uh, of the investor and the analyst community, and uh, the question of the uh, the, uh, the jury is obviously open. Uh, which uh, which parts are really the most important uh, parts to you uh, uh, on, uh, on on that uh, on that perspective? The next question is: Is IFRS providing you with too much information, the right level of information? or not enough uh, information. And again, uh, you're getting the, uh, the answers, the reactions from all these uh, different types of categories. And again, uh, the, uh, this, uh, the, the dissonance is chiming in uh, because uh, here, IFRS, uh, we are seeing uh, is, uh, is green. It's, it's giving you uh, the right uh, level of information predominantly. But uh, if we were asking the same question uh, for reports for uh, for uh, Swiss Gap, then uh, the color makeup changes significantly. I don't need to go into the uh, into too much detail, but the, uh, but just have a look uh, at the colors. Uh, basically, the the green is is counterbalanced uh, by a lot of yellow. Uh, not enough uh, information uh, from the from the investor perspective. Uh, so I think. That's that's really a very important uh, and uh, and surprising uh, conclusion as well. Uh, it's surprising, by the way, in the sense of uh, when we actually thought about doing this survey, uh, then we were wondering, well, should we do that actually? Because uh, the the conclusion is pretty foregone. Everybody thinks that this is actually a good thing. What what, what will be the outcome, and uh, what can be the outcome? And uh, so that was quite a bit of a surprise uh, for us that act the actual response response uh, from, uh, from respondents uh, was, when you go into the detail, uh, was actually quite, uh, quite skeptical. Uh, now, the, the clincher, to me at least, uh, is really uh, the faithful representation of economic reality, uh, uh, whether, whether your set of numbers, whether your uh, financial reports uh, really does uh, faithfully represent economic reality. Uh, and again, here, uh, when you are asked to rate uh, the, uh, that faithful representativeness uh, of IFRS reports uh, versus that of, uh, of Swiss Gap, uh, then it's uh, pretty clear uh, across the board uh, that faithful representativeness of IFRS instances of IFRS reports uh, beats uh, the, uh, the, faith, uh, the, the representativeness of Swiss Gap. And that's a pretty, uh, pretty strong uh, result as well. We also asked uh, in a number of uh, questions uh, the, uh, the preference uh, for one set of standards over another, and that per domain. Uh, we asked in the domain of pensions, uh, in the domain of goodwill, in the domain of financial instruments and hedge accounting, in joint ventures, disclosures, and presentation. And again, Pretty surprising result, I think. You can see that basically uh, almost across the board uh, in all these domains uh, there is a preference uh, for IFRS except uh, in, the, in the domain of presentation. So, Philip, uh, Steve, uh, <laughs> I guess you got your, uh, your, you get your task <laughs> set out there. Uh, I think that uh, those are really. Uh, I mean, you can always uh, ask about uh, about the representativeness, etc. And I'll touch on that uh, in a little bit. But that's the best kind of information that you can get uh, at, at this point in terms of uh, in terms of representativeness. And the the, the community is pretty difficult to uh, to actually get to react to these kinds of things as a whole. Uh, so the presentation issue is that one uh, aspect, uh, that one domain uh, where Swiss Gap is uh, beating IFRS. In all the other uh, domains we were asking, uh, IFRS uh, prevails. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, we have asked uh, 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 
participants to the survey to do a ranking uh, of uh, of the three of three uh, sets of standards that we were uh, looking at, and uh, they, they were asked to rank uh, uh, the the sets according to two criteria, namely uh, faithful representation again faithful representation of economic reality of uh, the reporting instances, uh, as well as comparability uh, within the industry uh, of uh, of the financial reports. And uh, also here, uh, uh, IFRS comes out first in both categories. And then second, again, in both categories, is even IFRS for SME. Uh, even though IFRS for SME is obviously not admissible for listed companies. Uh, but uh, SwissCap uh, still comes out uh, as third, uh, again, in these, uh, in these rankings. So just a little bit about the survey. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the survey was created as a corollary to the CFO survey that we just learned about. It was open to members of CFA Switzerland and to the Swiss Financial Analysts Association, so addressed to over 5,000 uh, investment professionals in Switzerland. Uh, it consisted of an online-only survey with 60 questions on 11 pages. It was open from 26 May uh, this year uh, through to 18th of August, uh, so a quarter almost of a year, uh, but that's also due to the holiday season at that time. We have had overall 182 responses, so from that overall population of 5,000 it was 3.6%. And uh, the responses were pretty equally uh, weighted from uh, from the SFA and uh, CFA Switzerland. And obviously, uh, we can all calculate uh, the, the 52 and 53 percent don't ca count up to 100 percent. That's because obviously there's a little bit of overlap uh, in dual memberships uh, in those two associations as well. Uh, so that's uh, the results uh, from my presentation. Uh, now, I think before we go into the break, uh, do we have time for uh, questions as well uh, for uh, to all the speakers that uh, that have uh, already presented? So, uh, Jerome, uh, Oliver, if you can come up. Oh, and, yeah, uh, <laughs> Philip. Well, thank you. Good morning. Uh, excellent presentations. A lot of uh, food for thought. Maybe one question uh, in one of the last slides uh, where there is clearly a distinction between Swiss Gap and IFRS is on the presentation that you uh, highlighted as a key. Uh, I would like to know more. Uh, what's behind this notion of presentation? What is Because this is clearly an area where we have to uh, consider seriously the results. But what's behind this presentation? Is it about the quantity of disclosures, or is it about the presentation of the financial statement themselves? Is it something to do about the PNL, where I understand Swiss Gap permit to highlight some uh, extraordinary items that we do not permit to have in the Can you have any idea as to what's behind yeah, this to? notion? Okay. Uh, but I don't have a microphone. Oh, <laughs> oh sorry about that. Uh, can you? <laughs> I think I have an idea. I don't have really, I can cannot substantiate it, but I think it's um, that Swiss Gap Fair makes more uh, or gives more guidance on what to present on the uh, on the PNL. So you have more consistency uh, uh, among the Swiss Gap Fair preparers what uh, the balance sheet and the uh, PNL looks like. You have much more diversity in, in IFRSs, and I think. It's good from a preparer's standpoint of view, but I think it's a bad thing from an investor's standpoint of view because I do a lot of uh, I do a lot of um, analysis as well, and I always struggle to compare two companies with completely different look and feel of of PNS. I think that's what they meant, but I'm, it's yeah. just my personal view. I would say another thing is uh, in IFRS and a report. Sometimes you have very very long for. Just take stock compensation, uh, stock, stock option, you have four or five pages to, to read. And I, I can assume that for an analyst, uh, it's, it's difficult to get into that. And it's probably the too, too complex, too long uh, things for them, because they don't have time to read everything. So I would, I would, I would think that. Ah, OK. So we'll be more disclosure. OK. OK. True, yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I saw 
the surveys, I find they are excellent. Uh, and then I uh, contrast that with one of the statements in the opening presentation. Apparently, uh, there is an underutilization of financial reports, which I don't find surprising. But how, how can you explain that in those surveys, you get critical responses uh, from investors that say, well, IFRS is really a better standard and rep represents more fairly uh, the economic background of a company when those financial reports were IFRS are built into are not really used? <laughs> That's a good question and I think it's actually in part uh, uh, connected to uh, w what I said about the uh, about this cognitive dissonance as well. The the user community, the, the investor community is an extremely broad one. Uh, you, get, uh, you get people who are actually uh, really fundamental financial analysts who go into the detail, who really use the material, whereas uh, other market participants are basically following uh, the secondary research and the conclusions uh, to what is actually happening. Uh, and there's an information cascade uh, that goes uh, through the market, whereas, where obviously the source uh, is really the financial reporting, at least the source for the, uh, remember the, the wall, the cutoff uh, wall there between CFA and CPA, the source of backward looking information, uh, reporting information is financial reporting and other information, the forward looking information comes in from other sources. I, I think that distinction here uh, is probably to blame uh, for some uh, of that of that disconnect you don't get you don't get comprehensively consistent answers if you're asking a, a whole range of people with different backgrounds it's it's probably not possible to get that so <laughs> and more questions there, there was, uh, Oliver was trying to, oh, it's actually switched off, I think. You need to turn it on first. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's coming. No, it's coming. Yeah. Is it working now? it takes a while. No? Yeah, is it on? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's on. <laughs> um, and so I'm, uh, I also um, talked to the preparers and asked them, you know, the opposite question. I mean, ha have you talked to your uh, uh, creditors and uh, to your uh, analysts about uh, considering a, a change and what were the answers they get? And the banks obviously said, well, actually, we don't care as soon as the level of transparency is the same as under IFRSs. So that's, what, that's the answer they uh, always get. So I think there is a perception that IFRSs, uh, in terms of transparency and level of disclosure, is maybe sometimes overburdened, but at least adequate for, for larger listed companies. So I think it's Philip and, and Stephen uh, did a quite proper job. But, uh, and the bank said, well, obviously, we don't, we don't care what kind of standard you use as long as the transparency uh, is the same. So I think there is a certain uh, proof for the answer we got from the investors. Hmm. It's, it's certainly the benchmark. We, we asked that question as well. Was part of, we had a lot of more questions than uh, just what I presented here. But uh, one of the questions was also re reg regarding the benchmark to which you actually uh, model uh, your uh, your financial models and uh, the result of that was obviously IFRS, not, not SwissCAP. Other questions? So I welcome you for the coffee break and we will start over at 10.35 here with Dr. Lucas Müller. Thanks.